Hello, hello, hello. This is Kenny Perkins, a.k.a. Your Cancer Guy. And once again, we bring to you another phenomenal guest. Why? Because all my guests are phenomenal. But this one, she's special too. We're going all the way across the continent of the U.S. We're talking about Florida. Right? I'm from California. She's in Florida. It's like across the continent. So this is where we're traveling to. But I think you're going to be inspired by this next guest. She is a fighter. She is someone who wants to inspire. She beats to her own drum. And she's not fearful to tell you exactly who she is and what she stands for. And that you have to love for. You have to love her for that. So it's an honor for us to bring our next guest. And please give me a round of applause of bringing Christine Handy to the show. Thank you, Kenny. It's such an honor to be here. Look at that smile. Good morning. Hey, how are you? I'm doing really well. I'm anxious to be here. I'm excited. We've been talking for a while. It's a good day. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. Anytime we can be upright and, and feel positive and, you know, be able to cast that light out to others, it's a beautiful day, no? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for doing what you're doing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to empower cancer patients, you know, through these insightful conversations. So to have you here and let me tell you, I can't wait to jump into it. So let's let's not let's not wait because this this person in front of me, everyone, any of you listening, Christina is a busy woman. She is doing so much for the community. She is doing so much, you know, just to get out here and bring awareness. And you have to love you have to love someone that way because. We need more of it. There's not enough. There can never be enough until this is all defeated, right? And so thank you for that. So Christine, let me tell you, let's, let's just jump into it. Talk to me about who Christine is. What is Christine doing? What is, what is she all about? What am I doing? Well, my background is I've been a model for 40 years. Four zero, not four, 40. <laughs> And that can be a bit a little misleading because the work that I'm doing right now, you would think has nothing to do with modeling, but it does have something to do with modeling because I get to wake up every day and serve. I get to wake up every day and put light into the world. And how I do that is I use every platform that I have, every platform that I'm on. And I'm just not talking about social media. I talk in the prison system about hope and giving people hope and remembering that hope is a muscle in your body. And that's what I'm trying to show the world. That's what I'm trying to show breast cancer patients. You can have a diagnosis and feel fear and feel despair, but you can choose to overcome those feelings. And that's what I'm trying to show them. I'm trying to live a life of thriving, not just survival. I'm also working in the modeling space as a model, as a breast cancer survivor, but also as a flat model. I lost my chest in 2012 to breast cancer and subsequently had breast implants. After that, I had a MRSA infection in my chest in the implants and I got breast implant illness and those were excavated in 2020. And so I woke up in 2020 in the middle of COVID when everybody was isolated and I was in the hospital and had the reality, the harsh reality of, you know, waking up with no chest and no chance of revision. So I quickly tried to figure out a way to use that platform as well to help people. I went back to modeling. I started to work with Victoria's Secret as a breastless model for them. I started going, I started to walk in New York Fashion Week. I walked in Miami Swim Week. Now, all of those things seem, I'm saying them so like easily and so blase. It was not easy. And it's not, I'm not trying to say it, you know, so blase. It worked. I worked really hard to do those things because I got so many messages from people on social saying, I feel despair. I can't get out of my rut. I can't climb my way out of this duress that I feel. I'm paralyzed in my emotion. And my heart broke for those people because I felt like I could be a light to show them you don't have to stay in that paralysis, that emotional paralysis. You can overcome it. It's a focus. It's what, you're, it's what you measure your life on. And so for me, going back to the pre-cancer diagnosis, my measure was society. My measure was materialism. And none of those things kept me warm at night when I was going through cancer, right? None of those bags that I carry, none of those Prada clothes that I was wearing, none of those things fulfilled me or sustained me when I felt that despair, 
when I wasn't sure I was going to wake up the next morning going through chemotherapy or the red devil. Those things cl clearly made no difference in my life. But it was that like rock bottom that I had had to hit to say to myself, okay, if I'm not going to survive, then I'm going to show up every day with courage because this is all I have. I have today. And so if I can start showing courage to my family, to my sons, to my community, then maybe they can take that courage into their own life. And I can model that for them. So this is a long-winded answer to your question, but I think in life, I am modeling survival. I am modeling light. I am modeling hope for people in every capacity that I can. Wow. Uh, that's powerful. You know, Christine, that's really powerful the way you say that, because, you know, what we see today in models and the magazines, you know, is glamour, is the glitz of that and it's the beauty and everything of, it can be superficial. You know, I'm not saying all models are superficial, but what I'm saying is that yes. that can be superficial and, and, and everyone has this image complex about themselves. So you being in that world, right, we we're talking 40 years of it, you know, sometimes you can't help but to breathe that type of air. And so to, to get a diagnosis and go through something like that, like what you just talked about and getting your breast removed, this is what I do, right? This is a part of who I am. And now that's being removed. Man, that's a powerful, that's a powerful way to look into the mirror. Well, it's a bigger fall, right? I mean, the more we try to elevate ourselves and when that gets really stolen by a diagnosis, that's a, that's a harder fall. That's a bigger fall. And it was, it, and I felt that. I w I'm not immune to how terrible that felt. And I didn't really want to fight for my life in the very beginning because I thought my value was only the external part of me. I thought that's why people loved me. I thought that's why my husband loved me. I'm, I thought that's why society loved me because I could give something to them. And that transactional world that I used to live in doesn't exist in my life. I don't do to get. I don't ever work in the modeling space or the influencer space or, or the interviews to get something from that. I'm trying to serve. I'm trying to show that transaction doesn't have to be a part of your life. And so by, again, by modeling that, I'm showing a very different way than I used to live. But I'm also saying I did it wrong. I'm not saying I've done this my whole life. I'm saying, listen, I was addicted to that stuff. I was addicted to ETV and entertainment TV and looking at celebrities and comparison and judgment. I don't partake in any of that anymore. I don't surround myself with people like that. And I'm not judging them. I just don't want that in my life. I want to be filled with, uh, surrounded by with people who have a mission. And, and listen, I mean, we can, I can go back to the modeling space and, and go back to what I was before. Now I'm in the modeling space as to have a purpose. There's a reason for it. It doesn't mean that the modeling space is there's anything wrong with it. I'm lucky enough to be one of the beauty disruptors in that space. In fact, I just won an award in New York Fashion Week for being a trailblazer in the modeling space because I'm saying like my beauty is I'm more stunning now at 53 on my I'm walking Miami Swim Week without a chest than I was at 20 as a guest model. Why? Because my beauty comes from inside and my light comes from within. Oh my God. So, so powerful, you know, and that, that it took a situation like this, unfortunately, right, Christine, to be able to shift your mindset, to be able to look and shift your perspective. But what you did, you didn't have to come back and show the world that, hey, there's something more beautiful to us. But you did. You came back. And that's the part where that's the courage. And I hope the listeners are, are hearing this. We put so much on ourselves for the external looks and how we, how, I mean, we don't even have to be a model. We you know sometimes we just, we put that on us. But if you listen to Christine, she's talking about how to shift that. She's out in the model community. She's out in that world. And yet she's saying, no, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to represent and trailblaze for those people who have, don't, don't have the things that these other models have. We're talking about breasts, right? I mean, I just, I mean, just to cut it short, right? And we're talking about if you have mastectomy. Scars. Breasts, scars. Right? 
physical, yeah, pain. Yeah. Christina, I, I thank you for that. I thank you for the transparency because this is what, this is what we need to hear. And to know that you won, you won an, um, to know that you won an award, right, for being a trailblazer. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. How did, how did that make you feel? <laughs> well, you know, I, again, my measure is not from society and I take that very seriously. My measure is my faith. So if I'm good with my faith, I'm, I'm just good. And so I wake up every day, even if I'm in chronic pain, I have chronic pain in my arm and I still have pain in my chest from being excavated so many times. Listen, there's, I don't know anybody out there who tried to rebuild their chest more than I did to have it taken away. Like that's the irony. Like I tried to, I had more and more reconstructive surgeries than more than most people. And then in 2020, when it got excavated, I was like, well, I spent years trying to rebuild this chest and now it's not here. What can I do to help people who are going through the same thing or who are choosing not to have implants? And, and how can I help them emotionally? Because I knew how bad it, I felt. And if I felt that bad and I have an unstoppable self-esteem, my measure is with my faith. It is not with society. And, and I have a community of people that, that carry me. Imagine the woman who doesn't have that. Maybe her measure is with society and maybe she's questioning what, who is going to love her because she doesn't have a chest and what does that look like for the rest of her life? Imagine how she feels. If I can feel this bad, imagine how much worse somebody could feel. So that was like, I knew at that point I had to do something about that to be a trailblazer, to show women that you have to work on your self-esteem. You have to work on the thoughts that you are thinking about yourself and the, the, the names and the, the things that you're calling yourself. I mean, I remember 15 years ago before I was diagnosed with cancer and I would say to myself, you're just not good enough. You know, who will love you? Man, I was beautiful. I had a chest. I had no scars. And I was telling myself I wasn't lovable or beautiful. Like we get that from society. Like we're not enough. And all this comparison is destroying women's self-esteem. And so I'm here to say, my beauty is better. I am more beautiful now and I don't have a chest and I have scars everywhere. And so if I can show that mentality and I can show that getting rid of the outcome, so many people I know are so afraid of getting cancer again. I live every single day with courage. What happens next is out of my hands. And, and that tether of fear is so toxic to people's bodies and to people's lives. They don't know how to move forward. And I try to tell them, you've got to build a new house. It may not look like your old house. It may not look like the house that you had prior to cancer, but you've got to build a new house. And who's to say it can't be better? Who's, it, who's to say it can't emotionally be bigger, right? My life is better and bigger because I made that, right? I, I, I said, I'm not going to stop my life because of a cancer diagnosis. I'm not going to stop my life because somebody said to me, this is your percentile chance of survival. I canceled that thought. I canceled that phrase. I told that doctor never to tell me that again. And I moved on with my life. And so my life is now about serving. And I hope that I'm a light to more and more people because I remember the pain that I felt and the fear. I just, I can't live like that. Yes. You know, Christine, I, I think we, we talked about it. You said you were diagnosed with a 2B triple negative. Is that, is that right? Triple positive. Yeah. Triple, triple positive. And so you get, you get diagnosed with something like that. And what did they talk about your treatment regimens and how that was going to go about? And then how did you get through that? Well, I mean, I was in, this is interesting to talk about because I think it's so important for people to take somebody with them when they're diagnosed because I couldn't hear anything. The minute somebody said, I have breast cancer, that's all I could hear. So it took me several appointments with the oncologist to understand the treatment. And, and my mind was kind of playing tricks on me because I, I heard him say that I had 28 rounds of chemo, but I kept saying to myself, no, I think it's only 16. And I think it's because you try to, you're trying to make yourself accept what you're about to face. And it's so much and so overwhelming. So my best advice for people who are di you know, diagnosed is to give yourself a bit of grace. You don't have to understand everything. You don't have to go to every appointment. I sent my ex-husband to some of the appointments without me in the, in the initially and just said, take notes. I can't even show up. I was so afraid. So if we give ourselves the grace that we give so freely to other people, 
it can set us up for a better success, in my opinion, when you start chemotherapy. So I had four rounds of the Red Devil. That was not pretty for me. <laughs> I was really very ill. Um, then I had, what is it called? The T, you would know it. I don't know. I, and then I had 12 of those. And then I had ultimately, I think 12 of Herceptin. It went on for 15 months. And I like to say to people, I really needed to be that ill for 15 months to, to change. I, I, I did such a huge shift in my life that I needed those days that were, I was just in the bathtub trying to eat because the warm water was the only place I could eat food. I was that ill. Or laying on the bathroom floor, you know, in and out of the bathroom throwing up. I needed that time of introspection. Like we can take that time of aloneness and, and fear and, and, and cripple ourselves by meditating on that fear. I wasn't doing that. I was taking those moments and saying, okay, how do I rebuild my self-esteem? Okay, how do I, if I, if I survive, what do I want my lo- life to look like? What do I want my house to look like? Who, do, who, the, who are the players that are going to be there? I got to choose. And it was almost like a game I was playing during chemotherapy. Like, okay, well, if I survive, then... I want to be here and I want this person in my life and I don't want this person in my life, you know? And so it made it more hopeful to me. And that's a focus. That's, and that's our choice. Powerful. Powerful. Speechless. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, and I think it's so, it's so true, right? But it, it didn't come that easily to me. I was under fire. I was under fire at my, in my own home. I was under fire with my illness. I was under fire with my arm, which is a whole nother story. I had other illnesses during that illness. I was scheduling arm surgeries between chemotherapies and breast surgeries. So I had no, no use of my right arm. This is a crazy story. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I had just had my arm fused. I had no use of my right arm because it was rebuilt with cadaver bones and a cadaver Achilles tendon. I could not use my right arm. I went in immediately for a lumpectomy because I couldn't start chemo because the chemo would have destroyed my right arm that had just been reconstructed. So I had to postpone chemo for 30 days. Now that's really some sort of mental duress. So they do a lumpectomy immediately and now I can't, and they took lymph nodes. So now I can't use either arm because if you know if you take lymph nodes, you can't lift your arm above a certain position. I could not take a sip of water. I had no arms. Somebody had to give me water with a straw. Somebody had to feed me. So for the first like two weeks of diagnosis, I'm about to forget my modeling career. I have no idea if I'm going to live or die. And I have no use of both arms. Talk about having going from being very self-sufficient to being so humbled and having to say, okay, I need everybody to take care of me. I, I, I couldn't take care of myself. Well, that was the first time where I had to say to myself, okay, I'm, I'm, I have to die to myself in order to live. And it was almost like I needed that tether, that, that really strong tether in order to get rid of the, the old version of me, in order to you know, spring into this different version of me where I took everything in my life and said, I'm going to serve with this. I'm going to use my modeling career. I'm going to use the fact that I'm a good speaker. I'm going to use the fact that I've been in front of a camera for 40 years. I can talk about this stuff. And I can say, this is how I did it wrong. And this is how I rebuilt my life. And maybe that teaches people. Absolutely. I mean, you're dropping so many gems right now, Christine. And, and what I hear, this common denominator, and I, I, I know it, I know it for myself. You know, when you're in your worst position or condition or the, the worst place in life, sometimes the way to get out of that is to serve others, right? And they say there's so much more happiness in giving than receiving. And that, that principle is true. You know, I, I sit here and I listen to you about all the things that you're going through, but you, you transformed that. You say, I died to my current self. And then how can I serve with some of the talents that I had? And that's the blessing. And I hope you guys listen to what she said and don't miss that fact. You know, sometimes when you're at your worst, the way to get out of that is to go out and do something for others. 
Man, Christine, I, I tell you, 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 you are definitely a light here. So you go through this chemo, right? You, you've gone through this transformation of, my God, what society's put on us. And now you're trying to just live, right? At this point, how do you come out of that on the other side? Like what, what was a turning point for you? Well, I had a lot of women show up for me. I want to be very clear about that. When we have a support system, it's life-changing. That's one of the reasons why I wrote my book. It's one of the reasons why I went to become a speaker. It's one of the reasons why I'm so, I love using my voice because I like to, to talk about women championing for each other, women showing up for each other. And it doesn't have to cost you money. It can be a text. Like when I was sitting in chemo, I would get texts from various neighbors and friends, just hang on. And, you know, we're thinking about you. We're praying for you. Those are life changing texts. Because when you're at the, dis when you're at the depth of despair, those are, li those are lines, right? Those are lines of hope. So when people, when I talk about, you know, showing up for people, it doesn't have to cost money. It doesn't have to cost time. It doesn't have to cost resources. But showing up can be a simple gesture. And those are really critical for women. It, well, I can't talk about men because I'm not a man, but really it was critical in my journey. So they taught me what showing up looks like. It doesn't, it's not showing up in the good times. It's showing up in the bad times and, and both. It's not showing up only when there's a gala or a beautiful event in a beautiful gown, right? It's, it's, the, it's the, the, the work that goes into the gala into the night of the ball, right? It's that work. And it's the time where, you know, people would show up and it wasn't pretty and it wasn't glamorous and I wasn't doing anything for them. And so I think showing up for people is so critical in life, you know, not just cancer, but in life. And so they were teaching me just by the act of showing up that when I was going, when I was well, I was like, okay, I'm gonna show up. I'm gonna show up in my modeling to help people. I'm gonna show up as a speaker. And, and that took me to the prison system. If you had told me 15 years ago, I was going to be working in the male prison system, I would say, why would I, that, that would never happen. I get so much joy from helping people in the prison system. And, and, and some people say to me, what could you possibly say that would help them? I talk about hope. I talk about the boundaries and the walls that we put around ourselves. You can be in a prison and give people hope. You can be a prison and inspire people. You can be in prison and start speaking faith instead of, you know, speaking fear and despair. And so if you can ignite hope in, in places of despair, it doesn't matter where it is and doesn't matter the demographic, you're just providing hope. And so showing up to me is showing up in every space of my life and showing courage and saying, I don't need to show up for you when it's, it's the highlight reel. I'm gonna show up for you always, period. Yes. So, so beautiful, you know, to be able to, to transform and then see things from a different perspective. I, I, I love that. And I, I listen, I think about the listeners who may be going through this for the first time, maybe newly diagnosed, not knowing how to formulate a team. You know, how did that happen? Right. Because sometimes you don't know who is going to show up for you. And sometimes the people who you think are going to show up for you don't show. So how, how, what would you say to those that are in the process of formulating their team? Well, first, the first thing that I had to do was get out, get out of my own way. Because I think so often we as women will say, oh, I'm, I'm good. I'm tough. I can do this. I can feed my family. I can, I mean, I can use my other arm. I, I speak about that because I only, again, only had one arm during that time. My arm was in a cast. But I couldn't. And why, why would I have that? Why would I want that extra burden? Why wouldn't I allow people to help me? But I think in society, it's like, if we're not doing, 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 we're kind of looked down upon. And I'm here to tell you that's wrong. It's not, that's not fair to yourself. Having a high self-esteem is saying, I need help and I'm going to accept help and ask for it. That's what's having a high self-esteem. That's self-love and self-care. It's doing it wrong by saying, I'm good. It's not, that's not self-care. So when I let go of that pride, which is, it's all pride, and said, okay, yes, I need help. Then my life changed and people wanted to help. People want, inherently want to help. And the people that were kind of putting me or 
speaking to me about who I was prior to my life, I gently let them go. I got out of their way. I don't need that pe- those people in my life because other ones will fill the space. And that is, that is faith. I had faith that God would fill the space that was lacking. I had faith that God would fill, have the right people at the right time. And people came out of nowhere to help. And again, it wasn't this lavish and extravagant gifts. It was just people showing up. And so I think if you're newly diagnosed, one, get out of your own way, get out of your own pride and say, okay, I need help. And I think, and I didn't go through cancer during a social media that they came after. So I think now social media can help, you know, find people that are not showing the highlight reels, find people that are telling truth about life. And that's really important because if, if you follow people that are just showing the highlight reels, that one, perfection doesn't exist and it's not healthy and it's also not self-care to watch that. But find people that are honest about, you know, the journey and, and follow them and see how they're doing it and see how they see how they live their life and see what their measure is. If their measure is not with society, keep following that person. Great advice. Gems. Hope you guys are, hope you guys are taking notes here because Christine is, she's giving you all of the sauce tonight. <laughs> oh, Christine, you know, here you are, you transformed your perspective, your mindset, you're now serving. Talk to us about something that's been going on here. I, I, I hear there's a movie being made about you a little bit here. You know, enlighten us a little bit on that. So when I wrote my book in 2015 and I published it, it was published in 2016. And I just said, you know, it's meant to get out there. It'll get out there. And it really did kind of let go of all outcomes, whether I was going to get cancer back, whether I was going to stay married, which I ultimately didn't, whether the book was going to become successful. And I really wanted the book to be a film because I had looked around and watched movies about cancer and and Netflix about cancer. And it really can be very depleting because there are not a lot of stories of survival. There's a lot of stories about the protagonist that dies in cancer. And I'm trying to change that perspective too. I'm trying to say, you don't need to have, you don't need to feel like you have the scarlet letter of cancer, right? Cancer can be a, a community of joy of people celebrating life and celebrating each other and, and championing for each other. And so the movie is based on my book, Walk Beside Me, and it's going to have a happy ending. It's going to be a hopeful movie about somebody that has a hopeful and a, you know, a survival, a a patient that survives. And so I think that's why it's important to have a movie like that right now, because I look around, turn on the news. It's a lot of fear and it's a lot of, you know, things that don't show hope. Let's show hope. Let's show hope. And, and, in the movie, and in the movie, it's interesting because you see this transformation. You see the Willow is her name. The transformation from being this very materialistic, very addicted to uh, accolades from society to like letting go and just saying, okay, whatever happens, happens, but I'm going to focus on courage and, and showing courage and, and living my life, even in the mud and even in the pain. Absolutely. Yeah. No, those are the type of success stories we need to see, right? Because it, it's true, right? Because there, a lot of times what we see is just the negative portions of it. And there's so many more positive. And I, I think those needs to be, I think those need to be highlighted. So thank you so much for being a part of that journey and being able to give hope in that way on the big film, on the big screen. So thank you for that. And so what I want to do, Christine, is ask you, and you've mentioned it, but I want to highlight it. You know, the Christine before the diagnosis, as opposed to the Christine we have in front of us today, how are those two people different? How, how, how has things changed? Well, I love the grit and the persistence of the Christine before. I started modeling when I was 11. I had three jobs in high school. I was always an overachiever. So that I kept. <laughs> <laughs> that part of my personality I clung to, I, or I wouldn't have survived cancer, honestly. So that I knew at a young age. I had a lot of grit. I had a lot of persistence. I had a lot of tenacity. So I kept that. Some, somehow, somewhere along the way, you know, my self-esteem got crushed. And not blaming it on the modeling industry. I'm not blaming it on other people. 
but I missed the self-care part I, through high school because I was working a lot in the modeling industry. And to be honest with you, when you're a model, you go on a lot of go sees, you go see a lot of clients and you, you go in front of a lot of brands. But most of the time, they say no. It doesn't mean you're not a successful model. M very successful models get no's a lot. But that can, that can negate your self-esteem. And so when I had maybe my biggest job up until, you know, recently when I was 22, I was one of the, the guest models and I thought, oh, like this isn't good enough. Like why? And I was, you know, I moved to Barcelona and I was working for elite and I was living in the elite model management building with other models and it just wasn't enough. Like I needed more. And I look back and it was because I was insecure. I couldn't fill myself up. I couldn't fill myself up with enough modeling jobs. I couldn't, they weren't big enough. I wasn't getting enough. Uh, there wasn't enough money. There wasn't enough beauty. I wasn't young enough. And it was like, nothing was enough. That's an inside problem. That's, an, that's a self-esteem problem. But if I had known it then, I would have maybe paused and stopped and taken some time to do introspection. But the world is moving. The world is moving. And you're looking at the billboards and you're looking at TV and you're hearing all these other voices going, you know, that you're not enough. You're not enough. Look at all these people. Look at ETV and look at all these celebrities. And you're not that. Well, I, I focused on that. That was my focus. And so really our focus is what we focus on, we become. That's like true of everybody. That's universal. And so when I finally took a pause in chemotherapy, it wasn't, wouldn't be my first choice. That wouldn't be my first choice of a pause. But that's what I was given. That's the hand I was dealt. I took a pause and I was like, man, I never felt joy. I was very happy. I liked my life. I didn't feel joy. And the difference between happiness and joy is great. If you've never felt joy, go serve. You won't believe how you feel and you won't believe the difference between happiness and joy. And when I got a taste of that, when my friends were in essence serving me selflessly for nothing, they wanted nothing from me. I said to myself, imagine what I could do with my story. If I'm vulnerable enough to share it, if I'm capable of surviving this and sharing it, maybe I can show serving on a larger platform. And that was my focus. That became my focus. So it became everything I did from the moment I woke up was I'm going to serve. And, and so we can use our history. We can use our platforms. And, and, and it could be, and some people say to me, yeah, but you're a Victoria's Secret model on your film and this and that, doesn't matter. You can give somebody hope by smiling at them and asking them how they're doing. I don't do small talk ever. I strongly am, I'm very strongly against small talk. I'm not saying like, go say hello and just be like, and move on. I mean, actually look in somebody's eyes and ask them how their day is doing and be present to listen. That can change somebody's life. It doesn't have to be a monstrous gesture. These little acts of kindness can change our world. And that's what I'm encouraging people to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Well said. And I love the perspective, right? I love the transformation, you know, sitting in chemo and going, hey, I'm not happy. And you, and you figure it out, figure it out joy. And that may be a little deep for some, but it's okay. Joy and happiness. They're different. Two completely different things. Different emotions. Yeah. And uh, man, Kristen, I, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us here on All Talk Oncology. And it's, it's been a privilege. And I, I wish you nothing but success moving forward. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, for sure. Again, I'd like to thank everyone here that joined us today at All Talk Oncology. Here's where you'll find updated discussions from leading professionals. And believe me, we're going to make sure that you get everything you need along your journey. As I say in every single episode, you're not alone in this. We're in this together. This is Kenny Perkins, a.k.a. Your Cancer Guy. Until again, I'm out.